Okay, you can turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 30. I'm going to read a few verses before then. But... Uh, bless these words to our hearts today. Thank you for each one that's here. Lord, thank you uh, that we're back together again. The body of Christ, thank you for Buddy's uh, heart, Lord, and his offering when he shared. And, uh, bless these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in, uh, first, before we get to Psalm, I mean Isaiah 30, in 1 Corinthians 2 5, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Just keep that in the, the back of your mind. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Essentially saying that we really shouldn't trust in men, including ourselves and what we think, uh, because there's a way that seems right to us a lot of times, but in the end there are the ways of death. That's why, and then uh, this verse in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he abides the faithful, he cannot deny himself. The previous verse, verse 12 says, if we deny him, he will deny us. That's a basic principle. If we spend our life denying Christ, he has no choice but to not to deny us before the, the Father at the great white throne. But, but if we believe not, if we believe not, and I did a, a devotional uh, on this uh, a while ago, saying it really should be not if we believe not, but when we believe not, because I think every one of us have times where we struggle to believe God for a promise, for a thought, for his presence in our lives. We go through times uh, and we wonder where God is and what's going on. Does he care? And, and so as a result of that, uh, often our faith falters. And we might even get uh, a little antsy about it, you know, how we can get as people. And uh, we say, oh, how, how is everything going? I don't know. God's not talking to me lately and stuff like that. You know, I don't, I don't hear him anymore, blah, blah, blah. And it's because our faith has been shaken. And it happens to all of us at different times. And it's, so it's not a, a message or a thought at all to condemn us because it happens. It's part of the natural makeup of man. Uh, like it says in in Psalm 119, verse 25, that my earthly life cleaves to the dust. You know, uh, the, Pastor Shell did a message recently on the natural man and the spiritual man, and he was explaining how the natural man is of the earth. Uh, we, we have natural thoughts. Uh, we're soulish. We, we were created with a soul. And in that soul is the emotions and the feelings, and and we're subject to things apart from God as people, especially since the fall, when we were separated from God spiritually. And then there's the spiritual man, the new man that we have in Christ. But even with that, if we're not walking in the <coughs> Spirit and led by the Spirit all the time, then we can be subject again to our natural thinking. And when things happen to us in our life, uh, health problems, um, you know, Linda losing her son, finances, all these things that can frustrate us and cause us to wonder where God is. Our faith can falter. If you remember uh, Jesus warning Peter in the Gospels, uh, and he said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you. He's asked a lot for you, is what it means in the translation, and he wants to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. and, well, what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, but when, but I have prayed for you, 
and when you are returned, uh, strengthen your faith. You will strengthen your faith. His faith was going to falter. And Jesus knew it. And it happens to all of us. So what do we do when it happens? So I want to read you a story this morning out of Isaiah 30. Uh, and I want to, because this, this chapter is interesting because uh, uh, as uh, you know, a pastor, and maybe you've read this chapter on your own, and there's certain verses in this chapter that we glean and use in messages to show principles. But I want to preach it in the context of what's going on. And I want to show you something about God uh, this morning. So, so let's turn there. And, and this is a very, uh, just so you, you know, it's a very bleak chapter. It's not nice, so, <laughs> but it gets better at the end. Uh, so, I, so hopefully, uh, verse Isaiah 30, verse one: Woe to the rebellious children! Uh, you can probably imagine that you yourself have been rebellious with God from time to time. Uh, we all have. What does it mean to be rebellious? It means that like, your parents tell you to do something and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Be rebellious. Say, don't be rebellious. You know, my wife tells me to eat good and I go, don't want to eat that. <laughs> so stop being rebellious. Take your medicine and eat good. Stuff like that, rebelliousness. But we can get rebellious with God when God's prompting us to do something and we don't want to do it. And we simply say, no, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. I don't. But God's telling you to do it. And you still say, no, I'm not doing that. We're rebellious. It's just, there's no getting around. But here, this is a story of the nation of Israel. And they have decided to go ask Egypt to help them fight the Assyrians. And they were forbidden to do that by God. God told them way back in Deuteronomy, you will not ask for help. And, and, and lest I tell you to, you will not go to other nations for help. I will be your defender. I will defend you. Do not, and he particularly said, do not go to Egypt and ask for help. And yet, here they are, the nation of Israel, the, the leaders, figured they decided the Assyrians are coming, we need help, we're going to Egypt and ask for help. And this, is, this, is the, this is the reason for this verse. Woe, this is God. There's three different people talking in here. God, Isaiah, and, and the, the, the people of the nation of Israel, in a sense. So, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. What well, the first sin was going to ask Egypt for help. The second sin was paying for it and, and bringing gifts to them and actually doing it. So they were adding sin to sin. Uh, the reason it was adding sin to sin is because in the middle of that, having the mindset to go to Egypt and ask God sent Isaiah to tell them, don't do that. Don't do that. They wouldn't listen to him, as we'll see. That walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. But you and I, and, and I walk, and Egypt always represents the world, going back into the world for help, seeking, you know, earthly counsel instead of godly counsel, <clears throat> is us going back to Egypt. Therefore, verse 3, shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion? For his princes, the his there in verse 4 is Judah, his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. Those were two cities in Egypt. They had already sent ambassadors there to seek help for Egypt, and, and God is interrupting this and sending Isaiah to warn them. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help or profit, but a shame and also a reproach. So they were going to Egypt for help, even though they did not like the Egyptians. 
They were ashamed, but the way they were still, they wanted help. They were in a desperate state, and they couldn't trust God for their, for their <coughs> salvation or their redeem, to redeem them from their enemy. So in verse 6, the burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence came the young and the old lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. So in other words, they were bringing wagon loads of gifts to the Egyptians to say, here, we're going to give you all these riches. You come help us fight the Assyrians. And, and they're going down to this treacherous land and where all these problems were, but they were determined they were going to get help from the Egyptians. Uh, for the Egyptians, in verse 7, shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I have I cried concerning this. This is Isaiah speaking. Isaiah has cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. We use that saying a lot for us as Christians. It says, you know, to say our strength is to sit still. Be still and know that he is God, Psalm 46.10. But in context... It, it's talking about the strength of Egypt was to do nothing. That was Egypt's ploy. We'll get people to give us gifts, but then we're not doing nothing. We're not moving. And, and they had this, this was the, the, their plan and plot to draw people because they were a great, they had a great nation and a good army and everything, but they weren't going to help anybody. So, uh, yeah, you can come talk to us. We'll listen, but it's going to cost you. And then they would say, sorry, we're not going. Their strength was to sit still. And Isaiah was telling them that on their way. Like, that was his message to them. And so, for the, for the, uh, so now go, verse 8, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for a time to come forever and ever. This is an interesting verse, you know why? Because we're talking about it today. This was this whole story took place in 725 BC, and we're still talking about it today. God put it in the Word and said, This is going to be a story that will be talked about forever. This principle of going to seek help outside of my help when I told you not to seek help. And they're, they're, they are a rebellion. It continues to say in verse 9, this, that this is the story I want you to record, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Imagine that. The people, it would be like you guys telling me, Pastor, don't preach on sin anymore. We only want to hear about grace. And you say, that's so ridiculous. That happens all the time. When there are churches where the people control what the pastor says. And they say, this is here. This is what we want you to preach on. This is April 4th, April 11th, April 3rd. This is what you're preaching on on Easter, by the way. Make it like nice. <laughs> like, prophesy unto us smooth things. We don't want to hear about sin. We don't want to hear about we're rebellious. We don't want to hear that we're not living right. We don't want to hear that things are wrong. Uh, we want to do what we want to do. Uh, so we don't want you to prophesy right things to us. We want you to prophesy smooth things to us. Prophesy is really preach, right? Isn't that amazing? These people are very rebellious, where they're actually trying to control Isaiah, who's coming to them with God's message of hope and deliverance and warning. And they're saying, no, no, we're going to Egypt, and we don't want you telling us it's wrong. We want you to say something smooth to us from God. Like, you know, God is love, and he loves everybody. And no matter what you do, he loves you, and you can do whatever you want, and God's still going to love you. Because it says that in the Bible. And, it, and don't worry about it if you just blatantly sin and do all that. There's no consequences. You can do whatever you want because God is love. And, and when you get to heaven, there's all kinds of lollipops waiting for you and stuff. You know. <laughs> what about the great white one? No, no, we don't talk about that. that. 
We don't even know if that's true. And what do we do? All these things. What about hell? You know how many people say there's no hell? Because they don't want to believe in the hell. They don't want to hear about hell. I was reading a, a, a portion from Charles Spurgeon the other day, and he goes, if we don't scare the hell out of some men, he goes, they're going to be lost forever. Mm -hmm. He goes, because they won't listen to smooth talk. Men won't listen to smooth talk. Some men need to have the hell scared out of them. He goes, so if you don't preach a hard message as a pastor, then get out of the pulpit. Uh, I said, whoa, that's really... <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's not today. <laughs> but it's truth, you know. But here's the people saying, don't speak to us right things. Imagine, could you imagine? I couldn't imagine one person in this church saying that. Like, I don't like it when you talk about this sin or that sin because I'm doing it and I don't want to stop. Uh, okay, we're sinners and we do the sins and God knows that he speaks to us about it to convict us, not to condemn us, but we, just still we don't want to hear the conviction because, we, 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 this, because our earthly life cleaves to the dust. And we need to know that. So, verse 11, get you out of the way. This is the people saying this to Isaiah, get out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease before us. You know? The rebellious children, like we might say uh, in our hearts, uh, well, I, I haven't sensed God lately. He's not like, like uh, you know, I don't want to hear from God right now. I'm mad at Him, blah, blah, blah. But you haven't forsaken Him. But they're in a sense saying, we don't want God. We don't want God. This is the children of Israel, the chosen people. It's like, Get away from us, Isaiah. We don't want to hear about God. We don't want God. We want to do our own thing. You know? So, then God speaks in verse 12. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, like in other words, they don't repent. They don't say, I shouldn't have said that. I was wrong. God forgive me. They just think they stay on it. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. All I can picture here in this verse is, is you know, if you see those movies where the dam bursts, like, and like it starts with a little trickle and all of a sudden it just bursts and everything's destroyed and all of that. Uh, or a tsunami or something like that. This is what he's saying. Your iniquity is going to burst forth on you. It's like, it's, in other words, your life's going to fall to pieces. And it's going to be so bad that there's not even going to be a piece, of, a shard of potter's clay. Like he said, it's like a potter breaking a vessel where there is not even a shard left to be a scoop up a sip of water. That's just like splinters. Everywhere, the devastation is going to be so bad. This is the result of you forsaking God. This is the result of what happens when we forsake God. The, 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 the trusting in Egypt comes back upon us, and it, it, it really is not profitable. And he shall break it as the breaking of the pause vessel that is broken in pieces, and he shall not spare, so that it shall be not found in the bursting of it a shard to take the fire to the heart, or to take water withal out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning in rest you shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. That's another verse we, we use a lot in preaching. In returning in rest you shall be saved. Yes, yes, that's true. You shall be saved in quietness and confidence, being still and knowing that he's God shall be your strength. I'm worried. I see the enemy. I'm going to go get help from natural sources. God says, trust me. Trust me. And he says, we just return to me. Rest in me. Rest in the promises. And it says, but what does it say? And you would not. You would not. Okay? It's a devastating picture of the children of Israel where they're just totally rejecting God. They're not listening to him anymore. They're not listening to his man. They're telling the, the, the prophet, get out of here. Get away from us. I don't want to hear the message anymore. I'm, I'm, God has been quiet. I'm not following him. I'm done with God and all of that. And, and so... 
God, of course, says, so this is the result of that. Devastation is coming upon you. Uh, because of, the, of your rebelliousness, because you're basically bringing it upon yourself. Pharaoh's not going to help you. He's not going to even support you. His strength is to sit still. He's not going to come to your aid. So therefore, you're going to be overwhelmed because you won't come to me for help. You're going to someone who won't help you. And so you're left with your problem. And it's going to destroy you. And it's because you. this is what you wanted. This is what you wanted. And it's, you would think that, that this chapter ends with a very dismal outlook, but it, it gets good. I mean, finish up here in verse 17. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. Another verse we use in Christianity to say, with God on our side, we can chase a thousand. Amen? Yes. God can cause a thousand to flee at us. Yes. But here it's saying, no. No, this is what's going to happen with you. Is that one, one Assyrian is going to cause a thousand of you to flee. That's how bad it's going to be. Uh, the rebuke of five shall you flee until you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain as an ensign on a hill. Basically, nothing left of the people, just a, a flag flying over a devastated land and field. But then this is the verse I want to focus on, verse 18. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. This is so amazing when you read the first 17 verses of the rebelliousness of the people. They're out and out the, uh, rejection of God and telling his prophet, we want nothing to do with you. Get away from us. We don't want anything to do with God. And then God says, yet yeah, this destruction will come upon you, yet I will wait. And that word wait is such an interesting word. It's chakha in the Hebrew. And it literally means to be attached to like a body piercing. You know, like you ladies, some of you guys too might have body piercings. Like it, it's attached to you. There's like a hole in your ear and the earring just goes through and it's attached to you. Like so if someone comes up, they can't pull the earring off because it's attached to you. When God says that he will wait <coughs> for us, he's attached, it's because he's attached to us, right? And no matter how rebellious we are, no matter how much we're faltering in our faith. Now, this, this, this story was in here because the utter rebelliousness of a people that forsook God. And I'm saying today that when we have our moments of our faith failing because of circumstances and we have times of doubt in our life and we have areas where we're trying hard to believe but we just can't and we falter in our faith, that God waits for us. God waits for us like a piercing. He's attached to us. We often think that God you know, we falter in our faith and God just keeps moving on down the road and we got to run and catch up to him, you know, when we get back straightened out, if we get back straightened out. We always feel like we're so distant from God. And we, we need to realize that when we falter in our faith, God stops. God stops and waits for us because he's attached to us. And I want to show you that in the, these verses here. <clears throat> if you can, turn to Isaiah uh, 40 now, 10 chapters up. <clears throat> God is attached to us, and, and, and so he waits for us. When we're faltering, we can't believe, this is what it means, when we believe not, when we falter in our faith, faith yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Right? So, we're walking along with God, things are going good, we're all this, but then stuff happens in our life, you know? And it would be great if when stuff happens in our life that we're at the place where you say, I don't care, I'm trusting God anyway. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's the goal, right? But there's those times where we struggle and, and we falter a little bit and, and, and we kind of just stop. 
We, we just kind of like life has gotten to us. And, and like it's not that God's going to cast us out and say, hey, I'm trying to tell you, keep up. We're going. We're going like Jesus is always going somewhere. And, and we, he wants us to follow him. But what happens when we stop? We're like the sheep that wanders off uh, from the shepherd. He stops all the sheep and he says, I'm going to go in again. I'm got to go get them and bring them back and stuff. And the nine, he leaves the 99. He said, wait here. I'll be back. Got to go get the one who faltered. And he goes and gets them and brings them back. This is the heart of the shepherd. This is God. This, look what he did with the nation of Israel. They're out, utterly rejecting him, but he can't reject himself. I have chosen you. I have called you. You are my people. And even though you say, I don't want you anymore, God, I'm waiting for you. Therefore will the Lord wait because he's attached to you. He was attached to Israel, and as believers, he's attached to us. So look at these verses in Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. And that's you and I sometimes. We get faint. We get weary and tired in the way. We get tired of the, the battle. We get tired of the warfare. We get tired of the details of life. We get tired of constantly trying to do what's right, but we fail and so we condemn ourselves. And we just get weary. It's just, a, it's just something that happens because our earthly life cleaves to the dust. And so weariness can come upon us. But it's what we do when we get weary, the mindset that we have and the memory that we have of what God is doing when we get weary. He's not leaving us behind. He's not. He's leaving the 99 behind to come back to get us because he's attached to us. So therefore, Buddy said it well. The favorite verse he was thinking of, Hebrews 13, 5, right? I will never leave thee or forsake thee. This is, that, this is it in a nutshell. He doesn't leave us when we get weary and when we have no strength. He comes back and because he never gets weary and he never gets tired, he infuses his energy into us who are weary and tired. and gives us strength. And it, to those who have no might, this is like a paradox, to those who have no might, I have no might. I've stopped. I've fainted in the way because life has overwhelmed me. The situation, whatever it is, uh, heartache, all of it, I, I feel like I can't even take a step. So I have no might, but he infuses me with strength. Amen. So it's not my strength because I don't have any. So it's, it's his strength because he has strength. He is strong. Amen. And so because he's attached to me, uh, it's like when the woman with the issue of blood came to Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I can be made whole, right? Like, I don't know, how many years was it? Seven years, 13 years, something like that. Issue of blood, went to all the doctors, and she has this in her set, so she touches him, and Jesus stops. Why does he stop? Because virtue went out of him. And he sensed it. Like he didn't, it wasn't like, can virtue come out of you and, and can you heal me? No, it came out because of her belief. But, it, but because he, he's attached to that kind of faith. She, she had a little faith that just touched his garment. That's uh, all I need. It, which is really a great faith to believe that. And virtue went out of him. So God, when we're faltering, when we're faint in the way, he will not leave us there and say, try and catch up. Try and, you know, you know the word, you've heard it, get, you know, pull up your bootstraps and catch up with me. It stops and he comes back and he waits. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to us. This is what he was saying to the nation of Israel. 
Even though you have utterly rejected me, you are going to a nation that I told you not to. You are rejecting my prophet. You are doing all these things. You deserve to be destroyed, and you are going to get destroyed by the Assyrians, not by me. The Assyrians are going to do it. And I try, I'm trying to stop it, but even though all of that has happened, I'm going to wait. Which means what? I'm waiting because I'm attached to you and I'm also waiting, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pour out my wrath on you. The Assyrians are going to. But in, through that, you're going to return to me. And I'm going to wait so I can be gracious to you. They deserved everything but grace, didn't they? They didn't deserve grace or mercy because they flat out rejected him. You and I don't flat out reject God, we just get weary in the way. We might get a little antsy and a little rebellious in our statements, but we know we're not rejecting God utterly. We just don't know what to do because we're weary and we're tired. And so how much more does God say, no, I'm going to wait for you too. I'm waiting for you. I'm not leaving you behind. I'm attached to you like an earring to an earlobe. That's the word picture that's in the, the Hebrew I'm attached to you like that. And so I will not leave you or forsake you like Buddy said. I will not ever leave you behind. I'm going to wait. I'm not going to execute judgment on you. Judgment was paid on Christ. I'm a God of judgment, but it was paid already. So I'm, I'm just going to wait for you to come and lift up your head out of the dust. My strength will lift your head out of the dust. He comes back and he infuses us with strength. Let's finish it. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Why? Because God infuses us with his strength. He comes back because he's attached to us. He sees our state and he gives us strength. How does he do that this morning? How? He uses people. He uses his grace, his mercy. It's supernatural. His strength is dunamis. It's supernatural strength. It gets infused in us, and many times we don't know, how does it happen? I feel better. I feel encouraged. Someone called me. Someone said a prayer. I didn't know they were praying, but all of a sudden, I don't feel like I'm just cleaving to the dust anymore. I have hope. I hope in God. We hear a message like today, and we have hope. Well, God's not going to leave me. I've been miserable lately. I fault, and I can't even believe nothing. You know, uh, but yet God's here. He's still here. He's still here. This is what's, what's so amazing about this. this. is what made that prayer so effective that Buddy was shared. But like, I, I want to know him more because of this. Because he's faithful to me even when I'm not faithful. And we will, I, I hope none of us ever get to where the children of Israel were where we utterly reject God and say, I'm done with him. I don't even want anything to do with it anymore. But maybe we, we have those moments where we falter a little bit and we, we doubt a little bit. Don't condemn yourself. Just wait on the Lord. It's interesting. Those who wait on the Lord as God's waiting on you, it's the same meaning as, as the piercing. Those who attach themselves to God will renew their strength. Amen. Stay attached to God because he's attached to you. That's the same principle as John 12, abiding in the vine. Inviting, I abide in you and you abide in me. I stay attached. I'm attached to you, so stay attached to me. Even though you're having trouble believing, when we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he will not deny himself. Amen. You know, your unbelief is not going to make God not believe anymore in you. He's going to come back and wait that he can be gracious to you. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you're a God who will not forsake us. You're a God who cannot lie. And when you say you're attached to us, Lord, it's the truth. 
Lord, we may not sense you sometimes, we may not feel you, we may not understand, Lord, but you're attached to us. You won't leave us behind. Lord, would help us to wait upon you. If anybody's watching today and they don't know you, they've never received Christ as Savior, get attached to him. Receive him as your Savior and you will become attached to him. He will become attached to you. And wherever happens to you in your life, wherever you go, he will be there. He will watch over you. You belong to him. He belongs to you. Receive him as Lord and Savior today. Ask him to come into your heart. Father, for all of us who get shaken in our faith, and it happens, Lord, it happens. We're sorry it happens, but it happens. Lord, help us to remember these words. Help us to wait upon you as you wait upon us, Lord, to stay attached to you no matter what, Lord. And remember that even when we have trouble believing, you are faithful, you cannot deny yourself. Lord, thank you so much for that, for these words. In Christ's name, amen, amen. Okay, let's stand.